two centuries, these hills overlooking the Connecticut River at Springfield, Massachusetts, have been the home of the famed Springfield Armory. The arsenal was deactivated by the Department of Defense in April 1968. During its long and colorful life, the Springfield Armory turned out more than nine million firearms of every purpose and description. Since 1795, American soldiers have been armed with guns from the Springfield Armory. Today, Federal Square, as the area is known, is still the site of armaments development and manufacture. Many of the buildings have been taken over by a large government contractor, and the production of some of this nation's latest weapons takes place here. Some of the buildings of this National Historical Landmark have been given over to the Springfield Technical Community College. The former headquarters of this military post now house the Dean's Office and the various administrative offices. Flanking both sides of the parade ground are the old officers' quarters, which now serve as study halls for the various technical subjects taught here. Well, the ground on which I am walking is rich in the history of our country. General George Washington founded this great arsenal in 1777 and later visited it during the time he was president. Well, Franklin D. Roosevelt was another of our presidents who came here. The list of famous military leaders who trod this green is endless. The beloved poet Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, after a visit, composed a special poem about the arsenal. That building was the main arsenal. In 1871, the commanding officer, Colonel J.G. Benton, officially created an ordnance museum, and today it occupies all of the building. It is called the Springfield Armory Museum, and contains more than 11,000 firearms and other weapons gathered from every corner of the globe. It is one of the largest collections of military arms in the world. Thanks to Colonel Benton, who lived in that imposing home over there, we will be able to see some of the guns which played such a vital role in the history of our country. Like the thousands who come here to find out about the development of our military weapons over the years, let us too see the guns at Springfield. At the outset of the Revolutionary War in 1776, the colonial patriots had very few firearms. There were only a handful of gunsmiths throughout all of New England, and work as they might, they couldn't possibly make enough weapons to arm the Continental Army against the British. But, as we all know from our history books, the colonists did get armed. Some of them were captured from the British, others came from various foreign nations, all were crude flintlock weapons, like this early French pistol. The story of firearms development in America is a fascinating saga of our Army's history. One of the nation's foremost authorities on this subject is with us today. I'd like to introduce him to you. Tom Wallace, director of the Springfield Armory Museum. Well, Tom, I'm delighted you could be with us to help explain some of the interesting background on the guns here at the Armory Museum. Well, I'm not sure you needed me today, Russell. From what I've seen, you're really up on the history of small arms. For instance, you were talking about all of those imported European weapons that our forefathers used. I have one here. This is the French Charlieville flintlock musket. Thousands of these were imported into the colonies from France between 1776 and 1781. Certainly seems well made, even after all these years. Did our soldiers like these guns? Yes, these are the finest military weapons of the period. The hammer had a piece of flint clamped in it, and the spark to ignite the gunpowder was created when the flint struck an iron plate. To load, the soldier had to ram a powder and ball charge down into the barrel from the muzzle end of the musket. He had a ramrod which was carried in the gun stock for that purpose. 
Then, a priming charge of powder was poured into the pan alongside the chamber. When this primer was ignited by the flint spark, it entered a small touch hole and set off the main charge. What did the Springfield Armory have to do about all this? During the Revolutionary War, I mean. Well, the Continental Army stored firearms and powder here. However, the main purpose of the Army during this period was the manufacture of this paper cartridge, which was used in the Army musket. It wasn't until April of 1794 that Congress enacted legislation that established the Springfield Armory and directed that weapons be manufactured and stored here. When did they make the first gun here at Springfield? It was a flintlock musket in 1795. Come over here and I'll show you. Russ, this is the first official U.S. Army weapon patterned after the French Charleville musket that we were just looking at. We copied the French design because of its obvious superiority in the Revolutionary War. This is the 1795 Springfield Flintlock Musket. It weighed about nine pounds and was a product of good craftsmanship. Our troops used these muskets, along with some of the foreign guns still in service during the War of 1812 against the British and Canadians, and at the Battle of Tippecanoe against the Shawnee Indians. Well, then this is the first U.S. arsenal-made weapon the Army used. Is that right? Yes. The gunsmiths in this country had been making muskets for a number of years, but they were for private individuals and various colonial governments. I see. What was the next gun that was made here? Well, we had some variations in the flintlock design, but in 1842, the big change was the addition of the percussion musket. Then we added some rifling to the weapon, and this increased the accuracy and gave us a better range. By 1861, we had the best military shoulder weapon of the day. We've got quite a collection of them over here. Incidentally, it was the display of this type which inspired Henry Wadsworth Longfellow to write the poem, The Arsenal at Springfield. Before the Civil War, he brought his bride here for a visit, and she remarked that these stands of guns reminded her of a great pipe organ. I guess he was pretty impressed because there were some 50,000 muskets stored here at the time and the hall was filled with racks like this one. If you've never read the poem, here's the first stanza. This is the arsenal. From floor to ceiling, like a huge organ, rise the burnished arms. But from their silent heights, no anthem pealing startles the villages with strange alarms. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, 1843. These are the standard model 1861-63 Springfield rifle musket. Both sides used these during the Civil War. Thousands of these were captured by the Confederates from the Union forces at the early stages of the Civil War. What makes these guns so special? Two things, Russell. First, the firing time was speeded up, and the gun was made more dependable because of this percussion system. The hammer struck this copper cap. That, in turn, ignited the charge in the barrel. Second, the mini ball, which is more accurate than the musket ball, loaded more rapidly. Despite the fact that these rifle muskets still had to be loaded from the muzzle end of the gun, they were a great improvement over the old flintlocks. Eighty percent of all the casualties in the Civil War were caused by this weapon. The 10th Massachusetts Battalion of Artillery from Worcester, the 1st Connecticut Volunteer Infantry from South Windsor, and the 14th Connecticut Volunteer Infantry from Glastonbury put on a demonstration of these old weapons. Vote! Fire! Ready, fire! Fire!
The most important thing about these guns is the fact that they were the first mass-produced firearms and had the advantage of interchangeable parts. I guess the mass production scheme changed things quite a bit here at the armory, didn't it, Tom? It sure did. Muskets had been limited in production up to the Civil War. The piecework idea, where each army employee made one specific part or performed a single function in the manufacturing process, enabled the armory to put out over a thousand muskets a day by 1864. Some 3,000 employees were used on the production lines. After the Civil War, the U.S. Cavalry had a rough time with the Indians of the Western Plains, Tom. What was the gun they used to fight the Indians? Was it the same one we just seen? No. By 1873, the Springfield Armory was turning out a new breech-loading gun designed by the master armor, Erskine Allen. Officially, the government called it the U.S. Carbine Model 1873. But to the technicians here, and the soldiers who used them, the guns were known as the Trapdoor Springfield. With the increased rate of fire and the long range of this weapon, our troops easily gained superiority over the Indians. This was a major factor in opening the western frontier. Speaking of the cavalry, Russell, here's a famous revolver which was issued to all cavalry officers in those days. Ah, uh, yes. 45 caliber Colt Peacemaker. Now, this was one of the great handguns of all time, wasn't it? Yes, it was. You know, old Sam Colt really designed himself a winner when he put out the six-shooter. It came in different barrel lengths, and a revolving cylinder bringing each cartridge under the hammer was practically foolproof. As a standard sidearm issued by the Army, it had no peer. It's been almost a hundred years since this gun first appeared. Today's revolvers still work on the same principle. Yeah, that's what I call a good gun design. Well, Russell, the Army has always been interested in good gun design. Come over here and I'll show you an interesting example. In the 1880s, two Norwegians developed this bolt-action magazine rifle. This was a great improvement over the trapdoor system. As you can see, the rifle had to be loaded one cartridge at a time. On the other hand, this Norwegian design permitted the loading of several cartridges at one time. And to fire each one, all the soldier had to do was to work this bolt. It ejected the spent cartridge and placed a fresh load into the chamber in one easy motion. In 1892, the Army was impressed with this design and paid the two Norwegian inventors a royalty of one dollar per gun to have the Springfield Armory produce the weapon for standard U.S. Army issue. More than 300,000 of these rifles were manufactured here. This was the first time since the Shallyville musket that the U.S. Army had adopted a foreign weapon for their military service. Well, if I remember correctly, this was the rifle used by the U.S. Army regulars in the Spanish-American War, wasn't it? That's right, and in the Philippine Insurrection and the Boxer Rebellion. But that brings to mind another great weapon that revolutionized the Army's weapon system. In July of 1898, a new close support weapon was used against the Spanish at Santiago, Cuba. The Gatling gun, invented by a doctor of medicine, James Gatling, gave the American troops superior firepower. For many years, this forerunner of the modern machine gun was deployed only as an artillery piece. It was an Army captain, Dan Parker, who devised a way to use it as a close support of infantry. His theories were proven at San Diego and later adopted by European tacticians in the trenches of World War I. During this same period, 
While our troops were engaged in the Philippine insurrection, they requested a rapid-firing handgun of heavy caliber in order to stop the human wave charges of the Moros. The fierce Filipino warriors would dope themselves up and charge in a frenzied fury. Our troops needed a large bullet like this to keep the enemy from reaching them. This is the automatic pistol that was developed by John M. Browning. Like the earlier Colt revolver, this is a design which has stood the test of time. Since 1911, the Browning pistol has been the U.S. Army basic sidearm. So that brings us back to the beginning of this century, Tom. What happened here at Springfield then? I'll show you. Well, Russ, the age between 1900 and 1936 was a great age of experimentation at the Springfield Armory. This is one of the fine weapons they developed in this period. 1903 bolt-action rifle, has a rear leaf sight here, standard Army weapon for many years. It would be safe to say that this rifle was one of the most accurate long-range shoulder arms ever devised. Hitting targets at a thousand yards was well within the capability of this rifle. During World War I, Sergeant Alvin York received the Medal of Honor for his exploits with the Springfield rifle. He was an expert sniper. He also captured over a hundred of the enemy single-handed, merely by threatening them with his Springfield. Yes, I remember this rifle very well. Here's a converted rifle that very few people have ever seen. The standard rifle was altered to fit the needs in the front line trenches of World War I. In that type of warfare, it was unsafe to stick your head over the parapet of the trench because some expert shot might pick you on. The rifle was converted to lower the butt portion of the stock and fitted with a periscope. A remote trigger control permitted the soldier to fire without having to put his head up in line with the sights. It was never an army issue, but the soldiers who converted it used it with good effect. World War I is one of the most brutal wars of all time. The trench knives were used by our soldiers in that war. But this was also a time when automatic weapons were being perfected. Look at these. This is the Lewis machine gun. It was developed by Colonel Isaac Lewis, a U.S. Army colonel. It was first used as a troop support weapon, but because of its light weight, it was quickly adopted by the Allied air arms. This is the machine gun credited with shooting down the great German Zeppelins over England. However, because of this rotary drum magazine, its firepower was limited. The Browning machine gun, perfected by the same man who gave us the automatic pistol, was water-cooled, relatively light in weight, and its 30 caliber bullets were fed to the firing mechanism by long ammunition belts. More than any other weapon, the machine gun gave rise to armored warfare. Of course, Russell, the Germans were not to be outdone. This is the machine gun they used both in the air and on the ground. It was developed by an American Hiram Maxim. In the mid-1930s, the world-famous M1 Garand semi-automatic rifle was developed here at the Springfield Armory by one of our engineers, John Garand. His invention was given to the United States government as a gesture of Mr. Garand's great love of country, and he never received any royalties nor payment of any kind. His superb design gave this nation one of our best individual weapons. During World War II, our soldiers fought their way through Europe and the Pacific with this weapon. General George S. Patton claimed the M1 Garand was the finest weapon ever used by the American Army. Between 1940 and 1945, the Springfield Army produced more than four million of these rifles thus surpassing the total output of arms for all the years between 1795 and 1940. 
And that wasn't all. U.S. Army troops carried the M1 right into the Korean conflict. General Douglas MacArthur said the M1 even outperformed the wonderful model 1903 Springfield, not only for its rate of fire, but for accuracy and rugged dependability. Here's something. It seems that the period from 1936 to 1957 was a very eventful 21 years in the science of weaponry, what was semi-automatic rifles and all. Yes, a lot of new weapons appeared during those years, and these are some good examples. The bazooka, a rocket launcher, was a revolutionary development and was introduced in Tunisia early in World War II. For the first time, the infantry had a shoulder weapon designed to penetrate tank armor. The recoilless rifle here, developed late in World War II, fired artillery shells and yet was light enough to be hand carried. This is the 50 caliber Browning. It was often used to shoot down enemy planes while they were making low level strafing attacks upon ground troops. I know the 50 caliber machine guns are being used by the Army today. So that brings us up to the present era of weapon development, doesn't it? Yes, Russ. Between 1957 and the present time, the automatic arm has reached a high state of perfection. The Springfield Armory played a key role in this development. Soon after the fighting ended in Korea, the M14 automatic rifle became the standard Army shoulder arm, replacing the M1 Garand. It was capable of firing 750 rounds per minute and weighed approximately nine pounds. When our troops first went to Vietnam, this is the weapon they carried. For real hand-carried firepower, however, nothing can equal the rugged M60 machine gun. It is relatively easy to carry, has a high rate of fire, and uses ammunition in a range of weights for good penetration of heavy brush and undergrowth. It is one of the Army's most useful weapons. In the airborne operations in Vietnam, it serves as a prime item of armament on our assault helicopters. Another special weapon was this M79 grenade launcher. It was used to reach out and hit the enemy when he was too far away for our soldier to throw a hand grenade and yet too close in to call for air support or artillery. Using big shells, it loads like a shotgun. It's very effective and amazingly accurate. The soldiers depend on this quite frequently. And finally, we have the prototype of the M16, which is used in the jungles today. The Springfield Armory is no longer making the nation's military weapons, but with the inventive genius of the weapon developers and the productive capabilities of the armament manufacturers, 
newer and more effective small arms are being produced all the time. Among the many new weapons designed to help our army do its job is this rather small automatic gun. It bears a startling resemblance to the old Gatling gun, and indeed works on much the same principle. The developers of this new weapon call it the Rapid Fire Minigun. Watch this. Almost 200 years have passed since the colonial patriots founded this nation through their armed rejection of British rule. From flintlock muskets to rapid fire miniguns is a long, long way. But in every step the American soldier has taken in the defense of free men, he has been armed with the finest weapons carried by any fighting man in the world. He has been secure in the knowledge that he would be back in war and in peace with the guns at Springfield.